So, got my name yesterday. I'm Jerry, manager of tech support. I'm going to be the one talking about single beam processing this morning. I'm not going to just read PowerPoints and I'm not going to follow a script. So, I apologize if that throws anyone off. I'm very interactive and I'm going to pick on you guys. I'm going to ask you questions to figure out what we need to do better. In tech support, we try to do everything we can to make your day better, but you don't ever call us because your day is great. Right? This is the whole point of tech support. No one likes to call tech support. First question I ask when I give training in a classroom or when I get on a boat, what don't we do well? What is it that we do that you hate? What step would you like to eliminate? How can we make your job easier? Because if I take steps away from you and make your job easier, you're more happy about using my software. So as we go through this, if we find something you're like, hey, that doesn't make sense to me, stop me. I'm not going to get upset. Just say, hey, what are you talking about? All right? Any questions? Good morning. I forgot to say that you're supposed to say good morning to start these. Days. All right, single beam processing. First thing we want to talk about is our single beam workflow. High pack records data in a raw file format. We didn't talk much about the raw file format yesterday, but this morning it becomes something we really care about. Our raw files are an ASCII readable file. It's something you could open up in a text editor and you can actually read the words and the numbers and the letters in there, right? So the difference between ASCII and binary, binary is something only a computer can read, ASCII is something you can actually physically open up in TextPad. The reason it's that way is when you call us up and say something's wrong, we can open it up and actually go through there and the tech support team understands what all those little digits and numbers mean. And we can help you with that. In the back of the help manual in HiPack is the raw file format. There's a header that tells us about your boat and your offsets and what sensors you were using. And then after that is just a bunch of data. So when you look inside one of these files, it shows, let's look inside one of these files. Get out of PowerPoint first thing in the morning. This is what a raw file looks like. And we didn't talk about this yesterday when, when we were talking about hardware and data collection, but like I said, now when we're in processing, it becomes important. The beginning of it just tells us the format, what version of the software it was, some information about your boat, your geodesy, um, which devices, they had a Planix Plasm V. <coughs> then you get down here to end of, end of line, that's your, your planned line information we can extract, and EOH. EOH tells us who the person was, the key, and the whole bunch of hashing crap that I don't care about. But then you get down to the bottom here where it's GYR. So there's our end of header. And everything after that is your data. That's how it's stored. It's stored in an ASCII file, you can read it. GYR is your gyro, EC1 is my echo sounder, HCP is my, my P pitch and roll, then I have a raw message. That Heave, pitch, and roll, POS, QUA, and RAW. Yesterday we talked about the GPS DLL collecting the RAW and the quality information. That's this information, QUA and RAW. Here is my latitude and longitude and elevation in GPS time, all in decimal uh, degrees, decimal minutes, I believe it is. Quality, number of satellites, HDOP, um, this is the number of records to follow. But the one thing I want you to see that's consistent amongst all the records, every record has the same portion. This 35,418, 35,418, anyone guess what that is? That's your time tag. It's the time tag in seconds past midnight. Anyone know how many seconds in a day there are? 
it's kind of early to be asking you qu pop questions, right? Mm -hmm. 86,400 seconds in a day. The reason I bring that up is if a lot of times you'll have a timing problem. Something will go wrong. We talked yesterday, timing's critical. Everyone remember me saying that? Timing, timing, timing. I said <clears> it like 54 times. If these are out of sequence, it's okay. Sometimes you'll have sensors that have their own internal timing. But if it's a jump of like 34,000 for this one, and then this one says 39,000, that's a problem. Right? There's a 4,000 jump. Anyone ever open up single bay meter and it says no soundings in file? If you open it up and it says no soundings in file, but you can see a track line and soundings in the, in the shell, the shell doesn't care about time. The raw files it draws are just the positions and soundings together. Right? It, it ignores that whole column. It says, where were you and what was the sounding? And it tracks that in the shell. And you know what I'm talking about by the shell? The main program you pull up? When you draw raw soundings, there are no corrections applied to it. There's no time shifts applied to it. It's just letting you know where you collected data. It doesn't tell you anything other than where you collected data. That's what it's all about. When you open this up, a lot of times we'll find that you'll have jumps in time. The sensor output a bad time. And then there's a jump in it because a lot of sensors give us the time now and there's ways to fix that. The other thing that common happens, customers will call us up and they'll say, I can see my whole line, but when I process it, I only process it to a point. So in the raw, in the shell, I see this big long line that's a mile long and I only get a quarter mile of it in the editor. The problem is you have these MSG records and you'll get some binary message out of your GPS. When that happens, the processor can't read that message file anymore because the binary gave it an end of file character. Because end of file characters don't exist in binary messages. They do in ASCII messages. So it'll be cut off and we can fix that really easy. Any questions about this? I just wanted to show you what it looks like. There's one other key point that I wanted to point out to you. This first number, that tells you which sensor that message came from. So if we go back up to the top, <laughs> You have device zero was the Aplanix, device one was disabled, and device two was a high sweep interface. So if you see a two, that came from the high sweep interface. If you see a zero, that came from the Aplanix. It's how we decode which source the messages came from. Does that make sense to everyone? I'm going to jump back into PowerPoint, so if you have more questions about raw files, I just wanted I to point out. Yes, yes, your sir. offset line. Yes. It's got a bunch of zeros. Now, it looks like it's just a measure down from your GPS antenna then. This <coughs> is XYZ offsets. Roll, pitch, yaw, and something else. I don't know what the other one is. Latency. So in this particular case, this was just a vertical. There was no X and Y shift. So it's just a measure down. Now, if you're correct, if your offsets are in a pause pack, a planet's pause pack, do they still show up in there? Is that just no, from this the is profile? just from high back. So if you enter your offsets in the in the pause, do you have them going to the pause center of gravity or going to the sonar head? Center of gravity. So you would still have your sonar offsets, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't have the pause offsets. Does everyone understand that? So in this particular case, there's a vertical in the pause to point it down a little bit, but it's not a shift out to the sonar. A lot of times you can apply the pause shift to where the sonar is. You don't want to do that. It's a bad way to do things. All right, I'm telling you bad ways to do things. First thing in the morning. All right, so now we understand what a raw file is, right? Everyone know what a log file is? A log file is just a list of raw files. That's it. It's just a text file that says these are the raw files you collected. So here we have, yesterday, Josh talked to you about survey and how survey works and how we collect the data and do the surveys. Then you get a raw data file out of it. The first thing you're going to do is bring it into the single beam editor. That's the first place you can clean up your single beam data. There is no other programs. There is nothing, nothing else you want to do with it. You could have a tied file. How many people do sound velocity cast? I asked that yesterday, right? How do you get your velocities? You import them into the sound velocity program, right? 
that's a step we skipped on this plot display. Some of them actually saved their own VEL files. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Class started a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, teach. I needed a break to get a drink, so I had to pick on that one. <laughs> so, TID files. Anyone know where you get a TID file? All right, you can have your own tide gauge and log it. You can go to NOAA's tide station, tide <coughs> page and get it. Or you can open our manual tides program and create it. So if you, if you have the gauge readings, you can actually go in there in the manual tides program. Did that hurt his feelings? Come on, so. Eric. <laughs> Man, Donnie can't handle the pressure. I know the guy, so it's not like I've made him. You know. Although, you never know. <laughs> the tide files, back to that. You, NOAA has a really great website. You can go in there and actually download tide gauge data um, for a lot of places. You can create your own if you have a gauge set up. When I first started, a lot of surveys were done with a guy sitting on the hill calling out over radio, this is the tide, and the guy would write it down, and then if it, or he'd write it in a book, and at the end of the day, you put it in the program. Nowadays, you can usually find a tide gauge somewhere near you. So once you have that information, and the same editor brings up a read parameters page, and we're going to go to that in just a second. I'm going to walk through this, and then we're going to do it. Read parameters, you can load up the tide corrections. You can load up the velocity corrections. How many people do not ever enter velocity? Anyone know? OK. So if you don't enter velocity, when you do a bar check, there's a velocity adjustment, right? And what depth of water do you think you need a velocity? 40 feet of water. Once you get pretty deep, you're, it's pretty hard to do a bar check in 40 feet of water, right? So I don't have an answer to that. I'm not, I don't make specs and things, but there's a point where doing a bar check becomes almost impossible at that depth. So having a velocity file can be critical in some jobs. It's more difficult to find a velocity error in single beam than it is in multi beam. In multi beam, you get that frown or you get the smile, but you don't get that in single beam, which is unfortunate and we don't have a big indicator. So, once we have our corrections in there, we go in and we go to a <coughs> cough. We create edited data. Now, what you can do with your edited data is you can do sounding selection or you can do final products straight from your edited data. Later on, I'm gonna be given tin model lesson. In tin model, that's something we would take our edited data into to do tins and contours. Sorting your data, cross sort and sounding selection. Sort, anyone know the difference between sort and cross sort? The basis of them? All right, sort is designed to give you the shallowest, shoalest depth first. So when you sort your data, you say, here's my big data set, and we don't normally sort single beam data too much, but if you do, I have a 25 foot radius on my single beam data. It's gonna go through your entire data set and find the shallowest sounding. And it's gonna take that sounding and it's gonna put a marker on it and draw a 25 foot circle and delete everything else in that circle. Then it's gonna go out and it's gonna find the next shallowest sounding, which just might happen to be on the edge of that 25 foot circle. Then it's gonna draw a 25 foot circle around that one and delete everything that's inside. Which is the ideal case because now I've got two soundings that are 25 feet apart. But what happens if the next sounding was 40 feet from the first one and it draws that 25 foot circle? It's kinda of like a Venn diagram. The two circles overlapped, but now instead of a 25 foot spacing, I have a 40 foot spacing between two soundings. Everyone understand what I'm getting at? You're not gonna get a perfect grid using sort. Sort's going to give you the shallowest soundings, nothing closer than 25 feet, up to 50 feet apart. You could legitimately have a 49 foot gap in a sorted file of no soundings. And that's because how sort handles the shallowest sounding. It cares about what's the shallowest sounding. HiPAC was first built and the software became used by the Army Corps of Engineers to do channel surveys, right? That's one of the biggest uses of it. So we care about the shallowest point. Cross sort 
Doesn't care. Cross sort. <laughs> this will be noted in your permanent file. <laughs> Cross sort uses a plotting sheet and a spacing. It won't let any sounding overlap. It doesn't care what the shallowest sounding is. It'll throw the shallowest sounding away. It actually gives you, and it's not going to give you every 25 feet because it doesn't know what it is. It's based on your plotting scale, right? So in cross sort, you have to know your plotting scale. You have two lines that intersect. You might have a really nice grid. It's going to look a lot prettier for a chart. It was designed for paper charts years ago because it would give you the same spacing between every sounding on the chart. I never look at a paper chart. How many of you actually use paper charts still? When you look at a paper chart, well, there's somebody using a paper charts. When you look at the paper charts, it's nice to have a nice stream of soundings, right? The problem is if they did it in cross sort, you might not have the shallowest point to worry about there. You just have a series of numbers that run down. Generally, you're not going to have like 20, 20, 20, 18, 4, 20, 20, 20, right? Where that 4 could have been the top of a pylon or nothing. So that's what cross sort does for you. Sort, it's not regular. Cross sort, regular, doesn't care about the shallow sound. The other way to get a gridded sounding, does anyone know where to get it? A tin model. Tin model will give you an actually perfect gridded sounding. It'll be five feet by five feet grids, but it also doesn't care about the shallowest. Well, you can actually, there's some priorities I think in there now, but I don't think it does the shallowest sound. Um, sounding selection. Sounding selection is a program that came along that allows us to pick uh, which soundings to use in a profile to, to kind of allow you more control of which soundings you're going to take and we have a PowerPoint on that. We'll talk more about that in a little while. Any questions so far on sounding selection type sorts and cross sorts, what they do for us? You doing okay everybody? Full belly's not putting you to sleep yet. All right. Final products. Cross sections and volumes, 3D TV, export to CAD, high plot, and tin model. Tin model, we have a whole session on tin model. <coughs> How many people use tin, tin model? It's a great program. It does things really well. We have a whole class on just tin model, the things it can do. How many people use high plot? <coughs> How many people love high plot? Wow, there was a whole bunch of hands went up the first time. <laughs> reason I asked that question is we just had a meeting about our roadmap for next year, and high plot's one of the things we're going to address. We're going to try to do some things for you guys to make high plot a useful program again. Something that helps out everyone. Um, I'm not going to go into it because I might be wrong by the final iteration of it, but hopefully we can improve what high plot does for everyone and make it a better product. 3D TV, anyone ever use 3D TV? Yeah. Not a lot of people use that one, especially with a single thing. But you've tried it a couple times in that. Export to CAD. Anyone use export to CAD? A few of you? You normally just take your XYZ data and import it into CAD when people bring it into CAD. How many people use CAD at all? Usually that's everybody's hand. CAD comes up a lot. Cross sections and volumes. I saved that one for last. How many people use cross sections and volumes? Cross sections and volumes is a powerful tool. It does a lot of good stuff, and it, it's we have a whole other PowerPoint just on that one. All right. So by the number of hands that were raised, a lot of you get to this stage. Do you use sort? Who uses sort? A lot of people use sort. Cross sort? No, not a lot of people use cross sort. Sounding selection. All right, we'll go through sounding selection just to show you what it is. If you don't know about it, you might be able to use it in the future. Sounds like most of you get to this point. How many people do any post-processing after this? You survey, collect data, and hand it to someone else. All right, so most of this stuff, once you get to that point, you're done, right? How many people actually do something with their edited data? Because at some point we have to get somewhere, right? We have to do this for a reason. 
The reason I'm asking all these questions, it may seem like I'm in a question and answer session, is so I know which ones we want to talk about next, where we want to go with the processing part of it. We're going to talk about processing and getting to this point. I want to know where you guys take it after this, because at some point, you either take it somewhere else, or one of these things comes into play. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, let's move on just a little bit. Same workflow, just to get to the edit. This is what we're going to talk about mostly today, this morning. Based on the time of depth measurement, SVMAX interpolates positions, tie, draft, sounding, and heave, pitch, and roll. Do you know how it interpolates position? We talked about time yesterday, but we never talked about one of my favorite sides. I don't know if it's coming up or not. I want to know how it interpolates position? Because you never get it, remember yesterday I said, you never get it sounding when it gets a position? They never happen at the same time? <coughs> So it takes your position here at time zero, and it says, okay, I've got a time. And it takes your position over here at time one. It says, okay, the time one was one second later. We got a one hertz GPS coming on, just for giggles. One hertz. So I got one second in time, and I took ten soundings in between. So it takes the first sounding, and it figures out the percentage of time from the beginning of time to the end of time to the beginning of time to that sounding and it generates a percent. And it says that percent was 10% of the time between those two positions. So it must be 10% of the position. So the <coughs> delta position, we multiply by 10% and say you must have gone 10% of the distance to get to that, and we calculate a new position for that sounding. When you look in an edited file, none of those positions are your GPS position. Am I blowing your mind right now? Everyone thinks I'm a crazy old man up here just talking and cough syrup? So 10% of the time becomes 10% of the distance. When you look at an edited file, all of those are derived positions based on the time of your positions and the time of your soundings. They're calculated positions along your track where the soundings took place. Does that make sense or am I blowing your mind? Everyone okay with that? Then. We apply that position to your sounding, and then we, we account for your tide the same way. If you have two tide readings, we figure out what the tide was in between. Or some, there's one method where it's just the static tide all the way through until you get a change. Um, same thing with draft and velocity and pitch and roll. Heave, pitch, and roll has its own time, so it will actually, in an edited file, show the time of the heave, pitch, and roll. Any questions about any of that? Did I confuse anybody? Good. So, what we're going to do is we're going to open up a raw file, bring it into SVMAX, I'll put it in an edited file and go to one of the other programs. How many people use the 32-bit editor for single beam? How many people use the 64-bit editor for single beam? How many people like the 64-bit editor of single beam? I'm glad the people using it like it. <coughs> we're going to go in and look at it. So, Corrections to soundings is in here. We talk about dynamic draft of the transducer going up and down based on speed. Yesterday someone asked me about dynamic draft because we talked about the static draft. If you're driving along in your boat, your draft changes sometimes, right? Your boat heaves up a little bit or kind of down a little bit. If you're not doing R2K, it's not accounted for. You have to do a dynamic draft to adjust for, as a driver for a speed table, you put it, I'm going one knot and I went up a tenth of a foot. Say again? Swap yeah. Sorry. I can't really hear much. It's part of my how I'm feeling. <coughs> Yesterday I picked on the Odom a lot because the Odom has a static draft and an offset. Static draft is the physical measurement of draft. How much the transducer head is below the water line. So we measure that and put it in the sonar to give us, so when we do our bar check, we put our bar down below the water. Not a physical measurement, right? Well, here it says determining correction. The bar check just doesn't do a draft correction, it does what? You used to adjust draft at five feet and address sound velocity at <coughs> depth. Does that make, remind everyone, more bar check? 
Echo sounder outputs depth below transducer or depth, depth below surface. Um, if you do depth below transducer from your sonar, then you would have to enter a vertical offset from the sonar to the water line. Most people have all that input into the sonar and you're doing depth below surface. That's why yesterday I said your bar check, somebody said the bar check was to the transducer face. And I said usually it's to the water line because I can't see the transducer face. So, all right. Any questions on draft? I feel like I'm just reading slides to you guys right now. We're going to go do the same in a second. Dynamic draft. This is the what I was talking about a second ago. As the boat moves through the water, the boat's changed draft because the boat pitched full, pitched up. Then you have settlement <coughs> and my duck. Draft table DLL is what you do with that file, where you put it in with speed and draft, the adjustments based on speed. Now this is the way to do it. They're using a total station to shoot the, the boat to see what the level did. How many people have a total station? Not a lot. Very, oh, a lot of you guys. Kind of a pain in the ass to shoot a boat when it's moving over the total station to figure out what the draft change was. So I don't know who came up with this idea, but I don't know that I'd be good enough to figure that out. I got a question for you. What do you do when the river has a fast current and it seems like you have to bring your boat up out of water just to still maintain the same speed? Or if you had a five mile an hour current, you have to get a lot power bring you up out of the water, then turn around and come back the other way and you take it out of here and you It'd be almost impossible because going upstream, you're going nothing, and then going downstream, you, well, you could, you'd have an inverted squat table basically. Because going upstream, you're going slow and rising, and going downstream, you're going <coughs> fast and low, right? Because you're going to settle back down into the water. So it would actually be the inverse of what most tables look like. Usually when you're going fast you squat you come up. When you're going slow you settle down. So you could do it. Your best bet would be an RTK. Because you can't control, you know, at one point going up river, you might be fighting it <coughs> and at one knot, two knots going upstream in a in a current. Okay, four <coughs> knots going upstream in a current. You're up out of the water a little bit, <coughs> but the boat's gonna be rolling around and doing things, your best bet would be RTK with a heat pitch and roll compensator. You could do it with the squat table, like I said, but just like shooting it with a total station, it'd be almost impossible to calculate that, I think. Unless you could figure out what it was and then build it afterwards. And then you'd have it for the next time. This is what the draft table deal looks like. Did I answer your question? Basically the Go up, yeah, go one direction, it's going to work for you. So here's your draft table DLL, and you enter it in speed, draft low, and draft high for that speed. This one they set up as a dual draft. You can have a single draft where you only have one draft. Here's the range of draft, it graphs it for you. And then as the boat moves through the water, it's going to enter a draft record. Remember that raw file I showed you in the beginning? It's going to add a DFT record every time it updates your draft based on your speed. When you're using RTK, this is not required. Your RTK antenna height, obviously that's why I was saying RTK, it's going to compensate for as you go up and down in the water column. How many people use RTK? Almost all of you. A big, big chunk of you. RTK has become pretty commonplace in a lot of the things we do. Um, it's removed a lot of the references we've had to do in the past. So heave, motion reference units. Heave sensor outputs its height above or below a current vertical reference. Do you guys understand, how many people don't understand what heave drift is? All right, well, we're not going to talk about it then. Do I need a heave sensor? The red, nice, straight line 
is with heave data applied. <coughs> Green data was no heave, and blue was no heave trying to smooth it. How many people work on volumes contracts? Inches mean dollars, right? So a little bit of an error in your survey can mean $10,000. Now imagine if you had huge humps like this that didn't exist, but you got valleys. It might average out, but it could potentially not. And how many people have to compare to someone else's survey? If they're using a heat compensator and you're not, it's going to stand out pretty quick. Correcting your MRU data. We talked about this yesterday. I got to take a second. Sorry about that. Correcting your MRU data. This slide, if you bring your MRU data into the echo sounder, some of the echo sounders will actually send us MRU corrected depth. Right? They've actually applied the motion to the depth and send us MRU corrected depth. Which means they need to know about all the offsets to the MRU. We prefer that the MRU data come into high pack. The reason for this is if the sonar corrects for the MRU and you had an offset wrong, how do you fix it? You can't. MRU corrected depth is MRU corrected depth. We don't know about the heave pitch and roll data, so we don't know what to do with it. So if you bring it into high pack, you bring the sonar into high pack, and we put it all together, we're all using the same formulas. It's fifth grade trigonometry, right? Geometry, trigonometry stuff, mood, angles, and all that. So we're all using the same formulas, but you can fix it. You can adjust your offsets in high pack after the fact. Right? In Sigma Meditor, now you can actually go in there and change your, oh, I forgot that my MRU was over here a foot, not two feet. You can fix that afterwards, and we'll recalculate it. As a separate device allows you to examine the raw heave, pitch, and roll data. <clears throat> that makes sense? I'm going to read the slides. Correction for heave drift. We talked about heave drift. I asked you if you knew what it was. It's that heave compensator jumps up high and settles down slow, right? So, um, Anyone in here from New Orleans? All right, my first trip on a New Orleans <coughs> survey boat, we were going 20 miles an hour across the river, running a single beam survey at 20 miles an hour, which we were going 20 miles an hour, did I say that? The guy got to the end, threw one engine in reverse, the other engine forward, and hung a left. And then we turned around and went 20 miles an hour the other direction. You went a core boat? Yeah. Yeah, they ain't stopping for nobody. <laughs> they don't slow down, do they? <laughs> So yesterday I said I was part of the team when uh, <coughs> Andrew or Drew was in here and we were turning them over to high pack and they were like okay we're going to go out and do our first data collection with high pack. We're right there at the core district office and we left their docks and went straight across the other side and there's a bunch of barges on the other side. I remember how fast I said we were going just now we were probably doing 15 at the core dock. <coughs> he turned there was a barge in front of us, and I realized we're coming up on the end of the line, and I went from the survey station up to where the guy was driving, and I said, hey, we're almost to the end of the line. I thought he was just driving us to where we were going to start surveying. He was surveying. And I look out the window, and we're about 200 feet from a barge, going 15 miles an hour. And I thought, well, I need to know where the door is, because I'm jumping <laughs> off this thing. <laughs> and I said something to him, and he said, I'm fine. I was like, okay. That's when he threw it in reverse and turned left on one engine, and forward on the other engine, and whipped around. I thought, man, this is going to be a wild ride today. They used to collect just the events and not the whole sounding data. And they would had one shot every 50 feet, just the events. We collected 24,000 soundings in like, well, maybe 20 lines. And they were used to like 100 soundings in the same period. It blew their mind. But enough about them. Correcting post processed heave. How many people use a POS MV? Do you guys post process your heave? If you have a PPK file, which is a post process file, right? Zero, zero, zero file. That's the file. 
you can go in and actually reprocess it. And post-processing your positions in RTK is supposed to give you, I don't have a lot of experience other than what customers send me, but it's supposed to give you a lot better position out of it. But not a lot of people, I mean, there's you know, 30 of you guys up there that raised your hand just now. You must synchronize the high pack clock to the IMU clock in order for this to work. Have to be synchronized, otherwise you're going to screw things up. And when I say that, you have to know how many hours between your time and UTC time so that it can synchronize. What have I said for two days? <coughs> time, 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 time. Time is the most critical thing you do in surveying. You have to make sure the time is right. If you post-process your time and don't synchronize them, you're going to apply a heave that happened three hours different than the heave you needed. And to post-process PP, like the, the pause and V data, you have to let that run before and after your survey to make sure you encompass the entire survey time. So you could have the beginning of your survey apply to the end of your survey if you don't <coughs> synchronize the times. <coughs> Say again? Yeah. Yeah, the Ethernet logging and the pause data, you have to do it before to the right. end so you have a full encompassment. <coughs> All right, pay close attention to that time. SP Max and AV Max can read these files and apply them to the new stuff. The 32 bit editor, and I'm not sure. It says the new one can. Well, maybe the 32 bit editor. Read parameters. This is where you adjust your pause pack adjustments. Uh, just talk about that. Bar check. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Step one, you usually lower it and then adjust your zero draft or tide so you're reading what your bar is and then go to project depth. Again, 40 feet. Anyone trying to hold a bar at 40 feet? Does it work? Yes. How hard, big of a really bar do you have? Yeah. You gotta have a pretty good sized bar, right? To find yeah, it. and it's like, it's, a, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's How many people yeah, do, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. How many people do sound velocities instead when you're in that deep of water? I mean, that's what we want, sound velocities, right? right? We do that. That's a good... <coughs> All right, sound velocity <coughs> corrections, calibrating your echo sounder. Uh, what is sound velocity? Well, this top of the slide is a little bit wrong because calibrating your sound velocity with the bar check, you actually adjust sound velocity at the lower depth, so that none shouldn't be. Correcting sound velocity speed profile. That slide's crap. We just talked about this. Problems with the bar check, you get wave action, currents. Um, outside your survey area, it's more convenient to do it in a harbor, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the same sound velocity, right? So you go into a nice protected area, you might be near a river with a little brackish water that's not the same salinity. Salinity affects sound velocity. Surveying with a single bar check in an area where the sound velocity changes. Again, surveying in a harbor where you got a river flowing into it and the ocean on one end, you're going to have a change in sound velocity from one side to the other of your project. So there's some things you got to be concerned with. In that situation where you've got fresh water and salt water mixing and you're surveying, multiple Sound velocity checks, right? Drop it at both ends and drop it a couple times in the middle to make sure you get a good feel for it. The program allows you to have a spread of sound velocities. Sound velocity program, you can import your data into the sound velocity program. Um, direct import from these three sound velocities where it'll just actually open those files and bring them right in. Uh, cast away and multi you press one button and it's done. Right. Uh, sound velocity program, you enter the velocities, you enter the time, or the depth, and the velocity. Now, in here, my velocities are in meters per second. And then it graphs it. Any questions about sound velocity? Am I beating a dead horse here? All right, I'll keep going. Why sound velocity matters, <coughs> this is really hard to read up here because these numbers are really small, but where they have a change in sound velocity, you start to see the difference in sound velocity <coughs> and the depth. At 50 feet, a difference of 10 in sound velocity is a tenth off in your soundings. In 50, look, how many people survey greater than 30 feet of water? 
big chunk of you. How many can survey 50 feet of water? All right, so we're going to use 40 as our, our number. So if we're in 40 feet of water and we're off by 50 in sound velocity, how many people think they could make a difference of 50 in sound velocity by accident, not measuring it? It's four tenths of a foot error if you're off by 50 feet per second in sound velocity. That's in feet, right? In feet per second. 50 feet per second can give you a four tenths error. How many people have ever tried to troubleshoot what's wrong with my sound? <coughs> we should have a whole class on that. What's wrong with my sound? Sound velocity is really important. Correct bar check calibration too. So, single beam editor, you have this. Okay, so sounding adjustment. There's a program you can run, it's a separate program. <coughs> While you have the sonar, you adjust it, you drop it to different depths and make an adjustment and it creates a correction file for you for sound velocity. And you can apply that afterwards. I've never done that. That's why I would have to pause for a second. When I first started at HiPAC, I knew every button in every program. Now I don't even know every program's name. A lot more tools than we used to have. Water level corrections. Yesterday I talked about this. I feel like we're having a repetition here, guys. We're talking a lot about the same stuff. Tides, negative up, positive down. This slide's really good. It talks all about when you go into correcting negative values if the water is above chart datum. It gives you the formula we use. All right, tide corrections. Anyone want me to talk about tide corrections? All right, if anyone want to talk about tide corrections? Manual entry during survey, RTK tides. In the tide corrections? Yes, sir. Can, can you discuss the uh, editing of the RTK for the tide level? How to edit the RTK? Yeah. When we, so if we go over here to high pack, which is where we want to be. Two bit or sixty four bit. the steps how we get to that. Yep. Sound good? Yep. I'm in the 64-bit editor and all I did is load up the program and now I'm at the read parameters. So we're going to get away from PowerPoints because I'm tired of talking about them and you guys are tired of listening to them. 64-bit <coughs> editor and read parameters. First thing it's going to do is it's going to pull up the day and the time of my tide. It's going to pull up the name of my survey and all that stuff that was on that INF line I showed you in the raw file before shows up right here. This is the west turning basin. I'm in depth mode, not elevation mode, which means my positive numbers go down. You can actually export. How many people export in elevation mode? Anyone work in elevation mode? Okay, elevation mode, your soundings are negative. That's all it is. It's an inverse, inversion of your sign. Um, so in here, TPU, anyone talk about TPUs? That's all multi-beam type stuff that we don't really deal with, but TPU <coughs> is where you have to figure out the accuracy of your sonar, the accuracy of your GPS, and your error budgets, and it comes up with a value to determine if you're actually within specs. 
You can do that within the software. Generally, it doesn't fall into single beam hands. Snap to line. Anyone know what that does? Makes your boat operator look like he's awesome. He's the best <laughs> boat operator that's ever operated a boat. I have a question about that. Um, if you have a line that's not straight, why does snap to line not work? Like, for example, if you have a line that curves and then it goes straight. Because you can actually snap to two portions of the line. You have a multi segmented line, snap to line doesn't know which one you want to snap to. It's perpendicular to both lines. Yeah. If you get data that, that's been applied, can you undo that? Nope. Once that's been applied and it's saved as an edited data, remember it's a derived position of the sounding, it's not the, you, you've lost all GPS coordinate. Any other <coughs> questions about that? One of the things that, that we're addressing within the changes in HIFAC is some of the, the limitations like that. Our file formats are 30 years old. It's been that way because they're resilient and they work and they're good. <coughs> We, we're looking at adding some things into like the edited data to be able to put a GPS line maybe in there, and then you could extract that out and say, well, this is what happened. This is not a good idea for snap to line, unless you want to make a pretty chart. No one drives a boat with zero offset. It just is impossible. <laughs> so don't snap to line. Invert tide values. For those of you that didn't hear me, negative up. But if you have negative up tides and you're in elevation mode, you may want to invert your tides in your depth to get negative depths and positive elevations. That's what elevation mode is going to do for you. Ignore depth records before first event. Do you know what that is? When we start logging, we have a history of a couple soundings that <coughs> in our memory that we've held on to that we throw into your raw data. These are the first couple things that we know about and then the start logging event happened. So we put them in your file. So sometimes you want to just throw that out. It's not data I care about. Ignore plan line information. If you have plan lines in there, it's going to tra calculate DBLs, um, XTEs, the offsets and the distance in the beginning of the line. You can ignore that. Ignore the echogram. How many people use an Ethernet-based single beam sonar? Ethernet being it comes over a uh, network cable, and you can record <coughs> echogram data. If you don't have an, a network cable and you're using a serial cable, you're not going to get echogram data. Does anyone know what echogram data does for us? It gives you the bin file, but it allows you to pre or post process the digitized soundings. So your sonar emits a sound, gets a return, and it calculates a depth based on sound velocity. Remember how sound velocity is important? We just talked about that. You can re-digitize that bottom if you have echogram data. What you're doing is calculating the bottom depth and not trusting what the sonar's algorithm said was the strongest return. Anyone survey near eelgrass? Survey over something that's soft on the bottom. You get multiple returns, and sometimes you just have to digitize that stuff out. Echograms allow you to do that. If <coughs> echograms can be very large files. They increase the storage size on your computer because we're collecting the entire water column trace, basically, of every paint and building a display out of it. So that information contains a lot. You can ignore <coughs> it here. It doesn't delete the file, it doesn't get rid of the file, it just doesn't load the file. Okay? So if you're doing it on a slow computer, ignore the echogram data. Any questions? All right, so let's talk about corrections. When you go into corrections, we talked about tide files and velocity files. This is where you would load them. The other thing is, how many people survey RTK and occasionally you have a problem with your RTK, which we're going to discuss how to edit RTK, you can set a static tide, right? Just the tide was zero. Sometimes we'll do that to check out how everything was working within the, the software or how everything was working on your survey. Set the tide to zero. Your bottom might do this if you're in a lot of waves because the RTK tide wasn't applied, but there's times that you want to change the tide and just set it. or you're surveying an estuary and you get a tide afterwards, and now you want to just set the entire job to whatever that elevation was, you go in here and set the correction and type in a number. You load a tide file, load your sound velocity files, that's where you would do those. Draft corrections, you can set a static draft correction in here too. Devices. Remember before I said you could change your offsets in your devices? If you go to the Devices tab, 
it shows all of your files and you click on edit, you're going to adjust the offset for all of your files. You can click one file and choose something different. When you hit edit, it brings up this window. On this window, my navigation is POSMV, my MRU is POSMV, <coughs> heading was POSMV, high sweep interface for sonar, and manual entry for tides. Yesterday I said to you when we were talking and Josh was up here about the GPS as depth as an option. This is where you would find your GPS listed. If G GPS had depth as an option, it was the first device. You go to process your single beam data, and all of a sudden your GPS is telling us that it has a depth. You go in and look at it, and it doesn't ever have, you have no depths, right? You have tide and depth is all the same. But this is where you'd find that you need to drop that down and change it to the echo sound. That makes sense to everyone? I've only got one device listed. Under MRU, I could have none. I could use high sweep, or I could use the positive V. I'm going to use the positive V. And then under processing, our last tab of the day, you can apply <coughs> heave correction, correct for induced heave, remove heave drift, avoid double heave by averaging your tide. If you're applying the heave and you're applying RTK tides and you don't average your tides, you're going to have a double heave problem, right? That's why you average your tides but apply heave. Or, if you don't have heave, you don't average your tides. Does that make sense? If you don't have heave, don't average your tides. And the reason is you're going to use the RTK to give you that heave swells. So if you don't have heave, don't average your tides. Did I say that enough? Steer sounding beam. Everyone know what steer sounding beam does? As you pitch and roll, it calculates where that sonar was pointed to calculate the new position and depth. So instead of saying that GPS says I'm right here and I rolled over a little bit and my sounding was still here but the sonar was pointed that way, you can adjust your steered sounding. <coughs> what do you have to have to adjust steered sounding beam? Pitch and roll. Have to have pitch and roll. Can't do it without pitch and roll. Because you have to have the direction that it was steering the beam for the software to do that. Let's go back here a second and check back and use my RTK tides, which I didn't do. I just realized we're here to talk about how to edit RTK tides. And manual entry, I had manual entry and wasn't checking the RTK tides. If you adjusted your geodesy, we'll load up some data. Just like that, what happened? High pack crashed in front of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that doesn't happen all the time, but it does occasionally. You have that thumb drive I borrowed from you a little bit ago? We're going to have a station identification break. I tried to load multi beam data up as a single beam file. And I thought, well, it's got RTK and it'll work. Jerry, why are you doing your station identification break? I've got a couple of public service announcements that I forgot to make yesterday. So one is, um, Norman is able to do demos. If you haven't been to their exhibit booth and you want to um, see them demo one of their systems, they've got it down on the water. Uh, just stop by their exhibit booth. The other is that for our Army Corps of Engineers colleagues, we we will have a meeting at five, right, Jerry? Today, yep. right after the Q and A, and we're just going to do it in the large conference room across the way. So, just want to throw that out while I've got your attention. For a second. So, if it wasn't bad enough, high fat crashed in front of you guys. I just crashed it in front of my boss. Good timing. I don't know that I have a permanent file. He does. <laughs> You 
wouldn't be a high pack conference if it didn't crash in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. So we recovered from my mistakes. Hopefully it doesn't crash as much as it used to, the person that says it happens all the time to him. If it does, contact Josh, he'll fix it. <coughs> Finishing our break here, I gotta blow my nose. When you load the data up, this is what it looks like in SPMAX 64. For you guys that use the 32-bit editor, this is what the 64-bit one does. All my soundings are colored by file. So you can see the colors just repeat. All my files are listed here. It's a really nice integrated way to display everything. Um, I've got soundings by numeric, so I like to put them by dots. <coughs> And I'll right click and go to color file. I don't want to color them by file. So now I'm showing my soundings in my plan line by depth. <coughs> so each one of these little dots is a depth. Reds and blues. Oh, that's color by depth number. Oh, that's stupid. That's not what I wanted either. See all those little red dots up there? Mm -hmm. <coughs> you guys can see those. Those are all the spikes in my entire server that I loaded. It's the beauty of the SPMAX 64 is I can look at all the lines together. I can look at them in a profile like this. I'm going to take this and I'm going to say above. Drag a line. There. If I had fast to lead on. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines up there. I deleted everything except for that one. And those two. I just cleaned all the spikes out of eight lines. Now, if I had a thousand lines, it might be a little more difficult than that. Yes, sir. Yes. I have under depth selection, I have depth one and depth two selected. The project I'm using is the single beam project that's on your thumb drives. I stole from him because my iteration crashed. Not that my idea. And now it's colored by depth, and you'll see the greens, the blues, the reds. And the color by depth, do you still differentiate from each frequency, or is it all just one? Right now, it's just showing them all just one. Um, what was your question, Ned? If you anything that's below the line you draw, it's going to wipe it out. But the way to do it would be if you came in here and identify it, turn off one turn channel, off one channel yeah. and only turn on it'll leave whichever channel on you want. <coughs> So if you're cleaning up one over the other, I would always turn off the one you don't want to clean up. That makes sense? Yeah. 
So if you make a mistake, do control Z. Everyone know what control Z is? <coughs> Undo. And our programmers are nice enough to put it in. Anyone else have a question? You see what I did there with the line and drew it out? When you zoom in, you can see. <coughs> now there's now I'm coloring it by, in the beginning I had it colored by depth number. So now you can see the difference in purple and blue, which one is high and low. And that's just in, the, I haven't even looked at any of the other windows yet. I just brought it into the main window and cleaned up all that stuff just to begin my cleanup process. I'm not saying this is done, we're finished surveying or editing, right? This was just getting ready to clean up my data. So now I've gone in and cleaned up all the spikes that I could find. I see down here I got a bunch of noise, stuff I'm going to want to get rid of. So if I zoom out, I can zoom. Oh, I've only got one file selected. So if I select them all, Zoom extents, it's going to zoom extents of all my files. So, one thing I could do is go and look at my speed window. Can you guys see that okay with the black background? I feel like there's too much light up here. I don't see it okay? Not really? <laughs> okay. I get my speed profile. Sometimes you get a big jump in speed. Your GPS says you're over in Morocco, right? So, your GPS jumps out. You can delete that in here. The nice thing about the single view editor, and it came about with the multi view editor that we've since put into this one, every window you're in, all of these tools work. I can go in there and I can say, here's my eraser tool, and take out that chunk <coughs> of the survey. And it did. Now control Z and get it back. Even tied. And this is where we wanted to be a minute ago. Remember how I said average your tide so you don't apply a tide and heave at the same? You average your tide if you're applying heave. You don't average your tide if you have no heave. This looks like one big blob of color, right? Because RTK tide and heave are both jumping up and down in there. I can go in and I can select just one file and then I can actually see what's going on with just the one file I selected. I can see how heave and tide apply to each other. This is where I would go in and turn off my heave and say that tide spike was no good. And I can delete that tide out if I have a bad tide. Does that make sense to everyone? I can go in and edit that point out. I can go in and I could set my tide to zero. I could do a lot of different things. Um, you could filter a window if you wanted to filter your tides. You can select multiple, top, multiple runs to see if one line was better than the other. Uh, do the same thing with your heave, pitch, and roll window. It's a lot of scribbles up here. You have red is pitch, <coughs> blue is roll, green is heave, and you turn them on and off at the top so you can look at any of them. Every window is editable. One of the other nice things about this program. So if I come over here and grab this tool and I click that point, see what my cursor just did down here? <coughs> All the windows have co-located cursors. If you have multiple monitors, this is great. Anyone edit without a multiple monitor on a little laptop like I'm playing with? I got like a little 15 inch HP monitor that doesn't have enough room to do much, but I got a 42 inch TV on my desk as a second monitor, so being old, it works awesome. When you have all these windows, you spread them all out over your second monitor, and whatever you're editing on your primary monitor you're looking at, you click on it, and your left monitor will have all those things in the same place. I've got a question about what was going on with this sound, and click on it, it'll show you all the other parameters that happened at that time. I can look at speed, heave, pitch, roll, all that stuff on a separate monitor, click on it, and there it is, it tells me that stuff. I can also click in here and it'll do the same thing. I clicked on the map and said, what was going on on this line? It selected that line back here and then brought it up in all the windows and said, this is what was going on at that time. The 32-bit editor can't do that. 
It's one of the features of the 64-bit editor. So if you're in 64-bit, all that stuff jumps around together. It allows you to look at it at the same time. There's no sound velocity on this job. So now we're going to look at the profile window. Any questions about those other windows? Did I answer your question about editing RTK? Okay. So now we're going to look at the profile window. Same thing applies to the profile window. I can click anywhere in the profile window and all my other windows are going to jump to that window. One of the nice things about this editor when you're in here and you click on a window, I can, I'm arrowing through my files and it's loading each one of my files up right in that window. You have the up down arrow where you can click. How many people like to click their mouse? I go over here and I just arrow through them. Because it's the same thing, you're clicking a button. I like the arrow. I don't know why. But I'm showing both depths in there. We can turn depth one or depth two on. Any questions about this so far? Am I putting you all to sleep? That breakfast Changing isn't settling the in yet? Profile that you have. Yes, sir. Is that a channel file that you have loaded? This is a planned line file, but it was a planned line file that had embedded templates. So in the line editor, you can actually apply a template. Anyone ever do that? If you make a channel file, a PLM file or a channel file, you can export your LMW file with templates. And if your lines have templates, then you'll see the template in here. Can you import that from CAD? No. So can you import have, the, Can you import it from MicroStation? If, we have a, if I have a template like that in MicroStation, can I import it and utilize it, or do I have to do it in iPad? There's a way in the advanced channel design to do it from a DXF file but I don't know from a DGN file. I'll have to check into that. In advanced channel design, you build your channel and you can overlay your CAD file with your lines. Once you have, a, once you have it as a CHN file, once it's converted to a CHN file, you overlay your lines and export the lines with template points. And what'll happen is in plan line editor, let's go look at So at line 400, it's got 11 station points, 11 template points, starting at 0, 0, 25 and 0, it goes in, then it goes down and goes across. Originally in HiPack, our channels had 11 template points. There's a Chinese end area version that allows you to have as many as you want, and there's a couple of them that only want four template points, a simplified template, some of the volumes methods. But you can go in and apply the template to all of these and under template you can say take this template so I don't have to type it over again and just apply it to everyone or as he's suggesting if you have it as a DGN or DXF file I'm not sure about DGNs but I know DXFs we can if it's a 3D face DXF we can take a 3D face DXF overlay it with plan line files and extract the template information and embed it just like this already for you if it does that, when you go to cross sections and volumes, you don't have to load a channel. Do you use cross sections and volumes at all? Okay. How many people use cross sections and volumes with templates? Do you embed your lines, or do you load a channel afterwards? Anybody? Something that's complicated. I'm building a CAD first, and then oh. extract the faces out. I just want it to be easier for me to build some of these crazy channels in Sonic CAD. Oh yeah. Simple stuff we do really well, but when you get into the crazy channels, we've, we've done some amazing channels in advanced channel design, but it's you have to make all the faces, and just like yesterday in the what's new, where uh, Rob was talking about the what's new and you can do the polygon to figure out a zone, some of that stuff we could do a lot better now than we could in the past, but we're not a CAD software, we're doing our best to give you the tools we can, but CAD, DGNs, and DXFs, they... they that's their business. So in this particular case, can you guys see that profile okay? Yeah. I go, is that better? Yeah. So in here you can see depth first distance. In single room editor, you can do depth first distance if you have a planned line information. So if it's embedded with a planned line, you get the DBL, right? And 
it's how far you are from me right here, the zero point, not what sounding came next. And when we we're talking about going upstream and having to goose it a little bit to get the boat to go <coughs> upstream, so you ever drift backwards during a survey in a current trying to go upstream? You might have a sounding here and then a sounding here and then a couple more soundings that way. If you did depth versus time, all of those soundings would stack up like they were all going forward. But depth versus different distance, you'll notice that it'll actually have all of them in a line where they're supposed to be going across the channel. I can turn off any one of the ones I want. So there's just my depth too, it looks like my low frequency. Looks like we had a bunch of noise and crap in here, a little jump in our positioning. Turn on the other one. We we'll put in a strike depth. We we'll put our strike depth at 42 feet. So the strike depth is that purple bar. Oh. <laughs> wherever I click, wherever I click, anywhere on the screen, it gives me the vertical and the horizontal is taken off of the profile. So it doesn't, like I'm going to try to click up here right in the middle, right? This horizontal bar, when I clicked up here, this horizontal bar here is taping off of wherever the profile was where I clicked. It's giving me an annotation point, not. So if I say right here, it gives me the Z value at 43.8. See that purple line? That purple line is my strike depth. Sometimes somebody will have, okay, we want a number other than our channel, or if you don't have a channel, you can put a strike depth in. Scaling's auto. I'll put a color bar in, but I don't really care. Show your raw depths. If I show my raw depths, I almost guarantee you guys can't see it unless you're in the front row. There's a little gray line here <coughs> that shows it, what was raw versus what was sound velocity, tide, and all that stuff applied. So I can actually see what my raw was. You can't edit the raw, but you can see it. And then you can go up and down through your arrows. If I right click, there's search and filter options. We'll go to that in a minute. View options. Normal dot size, we'll put them at five so you can see a little better. We go points. I can make the line a lot thicker. Sometimes <coughs> sometimes I won't edit in a line. Like I had it in a line a second ago and it didn't look like I had any real bad spikes. When you go to dots, there's a bunch of dots that kind of fall out of place there. Does that make sense? Sometimes you can see it better by just by changing it for a second. How many people use the profile window? People like the profile window. I ask a lot of questions. Have you figured that out? <laughs> it's got to be interactive. That way I know what we need to change or what you guys like to use. Apparently I have diet coke in the moment. That was an opening, Josh. You didn't have nothing to say. <coughs> survey, what he's asking a question about is if you're in survey and you have a profile window up. Anyone use a profile window in survey? So if you're in survey running a profile window and you finish that line, set of lanes and you want to bring a new set of lines up, you're going to go to a new area and you load a new set of lines, it removes your profile window. Do you know why? Because when you select the new line file in the software, they say take away your line file and as soon as you take away your line file you can't have a profile window because there's no profile to show and then you load a new line file you have to go back to the vessels and select the profile window 
Oh, we have to turn the survey off. Oh, we do, yeah. We figured it out. It will not come back up. So. Did you have to track the story? Yeah, you're you're talking about. yeah, I've done that before. We've had that problem. You go back into the vessel and try to load it, and it won't let you bring yeah, that so we've done So that. it's dead forever. And the window okay. manager, like he's saying, you can try the window manager. It just they won't appear. Joshua. Yes. Write this down, please. <laughs> the survey window. It's always nice having coworkers you can pick on. <laughs> the profile window reload line causes restart of survey. We will check with John Marinuzzi about that. John Marinuzzi, everyone meet John Marinuzzi? He's a guy who gave you your badge, probably. He works on the survey program. I know the problem you're talking about, so I know it's been discussed. I don't know if it's been resolved in 2020. It, it takes a second to bring it back up. It's not that big a deal, but yeah. it is what it is. Here's the thing about that. Mm -hmm. He just said, I'm going to repeat you. Yeah, it only takes a second, so it's not that big of a deal. How many people in here have something in high pack that annoys you that only takes a second? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the amount of laughter, it's pretty common that there's something that doesn't work exactly how it should work, right? How many people use software other than HiPEC? All of you, because you all use something. There's a, something in every program that doesn't work exactly how you want that annoys you. How many of you use HiPEC a lot? So think about that little thing that he just said. This is not a big deal, it's just something we want you to know about. It only takes a second. But I'm in tech support. So every little thing that you have that is a snickering point, oh, HiPEC, I just got to reload this and it's a pain in the ass. If we can fix that, you're happier. Let us know. Josh will get it taken care of. <laughs> right away. Feel like I'm picking on you yet? No, no. Oh, man. I pick on him even outside of the conference. So. No, but that's important to us. It's stuff we care about. I don't want you guys to say, oh, yeah, I just, it's okay. I mean, I appreciate it. There's a lot of things that go wrong. Anyone go on a survey and nothing failed? <laughs> and I'm not just talking about HiPAC. <laughs> I got a friend that surveys that calls me every time he surveys with some other bitch, and it's never, well, HiPAC's line file didn't load. It's my serial port and my USB port isn't working, and then by the time I talk him through the whole thing, he's an older guy, and say, pull out the USB thing and look at it. Oh, it wasn't plugged in. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> the last two hours of me talking to you, that was something you might have looked at. That happens. We want to make sure the tools we provide you don't cause those little snicker moments because right now it's a snicker moment, right? Four foot C's coming out of the channel and, and you're trying to get to a work site and ah, oh, damn it, I got to open my profile window again. It's not a snicker moment for you guys. So we want to solve those for you. Let somebody in tech support know it may not be something we fix. It may be there's nothing we can do about it, but mm -hmm. something like that, certainly it's an ooly that gets you. We want to take care of that kind of stuff. It's a great tool, I know it, so I can see everything live, so it's, you know. I have friends that have used HiPAC for 20 years that think it's a great tool to call me up and say, what the F is going on with your stupid program? So there's times that it just, it's like anything else. I did a lot of dredging for the last 20 years, going on dredges, setting dredges up, writing programs for dredges and working on them. I always told the dredgers one thing. For a dredge, HiPAC should be a hammer in your toolbox. You should start it up, you should go to work, and if you have to think about the computer, we failed you. Because that's not what they're there for, right? Same thing goes for you guys. We're providing you tools to get your job done. If the tools don't work the way they should, we want to fix them. We've got a whole staff downstairs, and you guys know John Lindberg is? John Lindberg, every day, hammers the program looking for things that are wrong with it. He's really good at it. He's been doing it for 22 years. Things get past him. But that's because there's seven programmers handing them shit that they changed yesterday. And we have yet to figure out why they changed, why the button went from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen sometimes. I'm like, it's been on the left for 20 years. I can't find a button. And then somebody says, oh, it's on the right. And Okay, why is it on the right? Are we getting close to the end of the session? we got 10 more minutes, I think. I didn't talk a lot about processing. I talked a lot about what the software does, and now I got off on a sidetrack for the last five minutes. I apologize. Let's get back to processing. It, once you're in here and you get done with this, again, down here I'll put a... a uh, 
all of these, oh, floating toolbar right there. So if I have a floating toolbar, I can do the same thing with these buttons. I can come in here and say, delete that one, delete those, delete that, delete that. You can go in and clean it up. You can change the size of stuff. Um, you can hide the side panel so you see more. I like to see the side panel. Every one of those editing tools works in the same way. Real quick. Uh, importing noise. <coughs> <coughs> There's that steered sounding beam thing I was talking about. We got 10 more minutes. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any high points. Then we'll jump back over the other program. Cheat sheets, background files. <coughs> was it off? Damn, I was hoping I didn't get recorded. <laughs> it got me on tape. All right, so in here, if you, anyone ever have one of those points where you're surveying and all of a sudden you have a short line and the line, you didn't get to collect all the data and you started over and said, oh, there was a barge in the way, turn around and start it again. This button right here, if you click on the short line and click that button, it throws it out of the edit session. It doesn't remove it from your log file. It doesn't delete the file. It just removes it from this session, okay? That way you're not trying to process it. And the reason that's important is when we get done with this and we hit save, we don't want to carry that on into our clean data set and have to deal with it again later, like in Tin Model or somewhere else. So we want to throw that away. If you don't throw it away and you save it into your edited data, when you go into Tin Model, it's going to be used in your Tin Model data. You see what I'm saying? You don't want to include that because you surveyed over it again a second time and now you got bad data in there. <coughs> Spreadsheet. The cool thing about the spreadsheet is you can set it up any way you want. Now, you can export the spreadsheet to anything you want. And I'm going to use this to bring me back to your edit RTK tides. Remember you can import your RTK tides in the beginning? So if you went in here and cleaned up your data, I actually could come in and say what was my time and what was my tide. So now I've got a time and tide that I could export that and get a tide file out of. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. One of the time, this time is in real clock time. Um, there used to be an option in here to have like seconds past midnight, but I don't see it. Maybe we got rid of that. But you can export time and tide. And then you could graph that and see what if there's any spikes you could take that out also or do an average of it, or is use it in another program. A disadvantage to using the tide analyzer before you go into the single beam map? No. There's no disadvantage to it. It's just another tool. The program he's talking about is the tide analyzer where you can load up your files, look at your tides, and clean them up in that program also. Um, it's an extra step. I would clean them up just in the regular ME Max or SP Max 64 because it's right there for me. Um, I can't average my tides. Part of the reason I like doing that is I'll run into <coughs> occasionally areas of our project where my RGK will be worthless five minutes after I start. Okay. And three hours later, I'm stuck with having to create a manual time. Oh, okay. I'll find out before I go through all the steps of the editor and realize my tide file is worthless. Alright. So, it, it, yeah, it's an extra step, but it prevents me from having to restart everything again. Certainly, it's a great step. If it stops you from spending hours doing it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else had that where they surveyed all day and found out that their tide wasn't good? Come on. You can admit it. Well, on that, on that is there, what I was thinking of, I had the exact same thing happen. But, uh, but, uh, no, it's, it happens. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I had RT. Earlier 
survey from the tide station that I downloaded and correlated those two and then interpolated, interpolated that difference after I lost my RTK using the tide. Does that make sense to you using the tide station? It does, but there's no way to do it. There's no way to merge the two together and create a create a curve. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sure, right? You could bring them both together in the manual tides program and then edit out. Like if you brought in the RTK tides to this point mm -hmm. and brought in the overlapping tide gauge data and then deleted out the tide gauge data so your tides would just feed in, yeah. but it wouldn't interpolate afterwards what the RTK should have been. Mm -hmm. It won't do that. It would just tie them in and say, okay, from this point you're using RTK up to here, but you'd have to do that in the tide editing in a manual tides program or Excel, but manual tides will be able to do it too. Okay. Everyone understand what his question was? All right. These are all the windows in SB Max 64 that we talked about and all the editing tools. Last one is the echogram window I talked about. How many people here have ever looked at this window? How many people? Sorry about that, I wasn't looking. Thanks. Um, in here, you can look at depth one. I've got depth one up here. This is the digitized depth based on what the sonar algorithm said was the strongest return. Remember I said sometimes you go over eelgrass or stuff and you want to digitize it out? You can go in here and you can click on this little digitizing tool. And I can say, you know what? That, 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 and that. I'll turn it off. And I just digitized out that little spike that I didn't want the dredging company to know was there. Do you see how I cleaned up the data? Just so it was a false sense of security there. I'm going to go in and say, okay, let's digitize over here so you can see what it looks like. So if you had an obvious error, if it had jumped off on this little fish up here or whatever, you could have redigitized the bottom. That's going to apply to your edited data set. That's going to be your new raw depth. Not your edited depth. That's going to be your new raw depth. You're saying the sonar didn't know what it was doing at this point and you're fixing it. I emphasize that point because you're overriding your sonar. You understand that? Overriding your sonar. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's clear as day. A lot of times it's perfectly clear to say, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. There's a reason we put it in the software. I mean, it happens, right? How many people think that their sonar is perfect? Anyone sit in the sensor theory class? Straw this week? You sit down and you listen into the single beam stuff. And it explains the cone on the bottom and the depth of the water and, and how wide your transducer face could be. There's always times you want to redigitize that bottom. There's, it happens. But know that when you do it, you're overriding your sonar depth. You can't go back and say, unless you go, you can go back to your raw files. But in your edited data, it's going to show up as your raw depth was really whatever I just digitized. That makes sense? Everyone understand why I would emphasize that? It yes, serves. So that, that change is going to be in the, the edited file, though, right? Yes, not in the raw file. It only changed the edited file. Well, two parts. So when you're doing this in the beginning, then you establish your colors because you're in a shallow area, different materials, different. So it uh, keeps crashing and going back to zero. So you're trying to make a thick, thick, heavy line. Um, then you do the clean process. I guess my difficulty comes in is that when you change those, you really, it, it jumps all over the place, it's so far apart. You're supposed to then be able to over to the right and it gives you where the best sounding is. And it is, you can end up having huge jumps when you establish that darkness of those lines. So when you change that to try and get it a little tighter, you're just changing the color. You go back into the setup of it where you establish <coughs> the, the thickness and darkness of those lines. Yeah. Um, because you're trying to narrow it down and get tighter because you're in a shallow river, for example. Um, it makes it difficult. You're constantly going back, changing those thickness of those lines, just so you can try and determine 
what is the act of the body as you're going across. I'm just trying to, so my question is, is where is the happy medium when you establish those things, those lines? And when you go back and set this screen up, um, you give two parameters of the, that establishes the thickness or density of the darkness of those lines. And I'm in, I'm in 32, not that different. I'm just set that thickness up. Anyone know where the menu is for that off the top? Right, right click in the view. Me in my mind, I'm thinking through the process. It probably would depend on the bottom types you're in, how the thickness should be set. Um, thinking about it as we're playing with this, I think the tool would be nice if I could click here and then pick a point in this window. So if I clicked on a point and I have to digitize, let me digitize the point over here. Does that make sense to everybody? That would be perfect. Because then I wouldn't have to try to pick the pixel. I could actually select that. And you have two screens, it makes it a little better. You pick it on the profile view, and then it shows you in the aftergram kind of better. But okay. That would work if y'all could do that. That's something to, that we need to add. Yes, sir. Corey. So, something I ran into in the same project um, was I went through my process to come to 30 day and check it, ran all my filters, and then there was clearly spots that. I could not digitize after I ran any filters. So I had to go back and start over, reload all my raw files, and then I could digitize all day long. No problem, as long as I didn't do any editing on the line until I was after the filters. So you can't digitize after filters. That's One other thing, we're, we're three minutes over time, I apologize, but one other thing I want to show you real quick, and then I'm going to answer Corey's, we're going to test his theory. This Thunderbolt and that Thunderbolt, do you know what those do? It's filters. It runs your filters. The Thunderbolts run your filters, but they run different sets of filters. Do you know why? It's really important to understand this because I had this question last night after we shut down and I was upstairs in bed sleeping. I got a phone call. <laughs> Wanted to know why the filters weren't working. This Thunderbolt is attached to the main program. It filters all your files, everything, right? Not just the file you're looking at or the window you're in. If you see a window like this with a Thunderbolt in it, it only filters the window you're looking at. So if you set a set of filters up for a particular line and you don't want to apply it to your entire survey but you want to clean this particular line up, do the profile window Thunderbolt. If you set a set of filters up and you want to filter everything, the main Thunderbolt. So I just did, I just ran a filter. And I said, filter all files. Let's go back to the echogram window. Let's digitize 
see what's going on. Looks like they fixed it. I'm running the latest version of everything. So, um, all right. Any other questions on single beam? I'm going to leave you with one more tidbit if you got no more questions. <coughs> Did I cover stuff you cared about? Did you guys get something out of the lesson? One of the things we changed over a year ago, and it applies this year and it goes forward, is the quarterly releases they talked about. We used to give you monthly supplementals and put the files out that we changed every month that apply to you. Now we're in this quarterly supplement or quarterly release thing. Every quarter we put a new version up and it builds on the last version. So 2019 third quarter release and 2020 aren't that much removed. There are a couple big things that go into the yearly release that don't go out in quarterly releases. But every quarter we put out an update. And that update contains some really cool stuff in it. So you don't have to wait a year to get multi-beam auto pre-process. And you don't have to wait a year to get stuff. Keep an eye on the website. Once a quarter you'll get an email or you should get an email. If not, check the website. We put out these quarterly updates. And that's everything that John Lindbergh's approved for that quarter to go out the door. And a lot of it's going to be some pretty cool stuff. So keep an eye on that stuff, and we're working every month to try to get better stuff in your hands.